As it's already been mentioned today, we are coming to the end of our month of prayer, where we've um, been a main focus on Luke 10, verse 27, where it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and all your mind, and love your neighbour as yourself. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And today, we will be looking at the mind. What's happening up here? Do we need to worry about what's happening up here? What is it all about? Well, Jimmy Roo, who is a life coach and author, he says, have you ever heard the saying, he who controls the mind controls his life? The opposite of that statement is equally true. He who doesn't control his mind has no control over his life. He goes on to say, you cannot control what others do or what happens around you, but you can control your mind. By controlling your mind, you in essence control the thoughts you think, the beliefs you hold, the actions you take, the words you speak, the images that run around your head, your emotions and your attitude. So in other words, when we're talking about the mind, when we're talking about controlling the mind, focusing on the mind, we're not just thinking about those little thoughts that might come in and out of your head, but actually what's happening up here affects everything. It affects your attitude. It affects how you respond to things. This is why it's so vital that we are people that know what's going on up here and we're controlling it. In Philippians 4, verse 8, it says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right and whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Now, this is Paul writing to the church in Philippians. And why is he telling them to think about the good things? Why is he telling them to think about all that is true and noble? Because he knows how vital it is that we make sure our minds are going in the right way, that we're focusing on the right things. We're focusing on things that are going to bring us life and not death. Focus on all that is true and noble. Now, according to the UK statistics for mental health, one in four people will experience a mental health issue any given year. It is estimated that three children in every classroom have a diagnosable ment mental health condition. And the statistics, if you read them, they're, they're huge, they're massive. When we start looking at mental health and the people that are struggling with them, we live in a world with an absolutely crazy mental health statistics where people are struggling with anxiety, depression, where people have just got no control over their mind, their minds are controlling them. We live in a world that doesn't like labels, that doesn't like boundaries. Even your gender today is now a choice. It's nothing to do by, by I can't say that word, by, Lolly, thank you. It's, it's all choice now. If you want to be a boy, if you want to be a girl, you choose what's right for you. And there's a lot of that going on. Our young people, we say, grow up in a hard time because there's no right or wrong these days. If it feels good for you, if it's not hurting you, then go for it. That is what we're telling people is okay to do. But you know what? We say it's hard for young people, but I think it's hard for all of us, whatever age we are, to find where we should be, to find where we should be focusing, to find out what is right for us as we're living as children of God. What is it? How should we be living? And this is why we need to be people that are taking control of our minds. In this crazy world that is saying all this stuff to us, how do we then make sure we control our mind that our focus is in the right place? Well, it can sound quite daunting, especially if you look at all the statistic rates of mental health, but do not worry, people, there is a solution. There is something that's going to make it all peachy and all wonderful. Because, you see, there is a new invention in our world. It is called the thought box. Now, the thought box is an amazing piece of kit, apparently. The Sun newspaper did an article on it, and it says, this is what the Sun is saying about it, the thought box is simply a black box and a stool. The company behind this contraption says it's intended as a personal space in which to simply think. With a world full of hundreds of distractions, the design company, the Forum Empire, is selling a baffling conception called the thought box to wear on your head in an effort to block it all out. The people that are selling the thought box says, alone at last, 
The Thought Box is an original and curious piece of furniture that promotes mental efficiency in the user. Simply lift up the seat. It comes with a black box and a seat. So it says simply lift up the seat, which we're going to imagine is this today. So we lift up the seat. Underneath the seat, you will find a black box. And what you do is you take a seat and with the black box, you pull it on your head. And then you stay there and you just take a moment. You just block it all out. And this, ladies and gentlemen, apparently is the answer. So in a world that is crazy, in a world that is like a bit like going bonkers, I think, on some things, there is an actual picture. Tom, do you want to put it up? This is what comes as the advert for it. So this, if you sit like this, this is going to help you control your mind and make everything peachy in your world again. Because in a world that is throwing so much at you, it helps you block it all out. The digital stuff, the actual people stuff, you can block it all out and just have some time on your own. Now, this box will cost you the bargain price of £395 plus £9.99 for postage and packaging. Anyone want me to order you one? No, some do. I'm going to have a commission. It's now gone up in price. But this is a conception that is being built because people are recognising that actually people are not taking time out anymore. People are not having time for themselves. So we end up with these crazy contraptions like this where you sit with a box in your head. Now, the actual idea of this thought box is not wrong. We need to be people that are taking ourselves out of situations, that are taking ourselves out of the busyness of this world and just focusing in the right direction. And the right direction is not inside a black box, but the right direction is we look up. We look up to God. I am saddened at the fact that a box like this even needs to exist. I am saddened that statistic rates of mental health are so high, especially in our young people. As you heard, I was Charlotte work in the schools, and in primary schools, we are told that there is more risk of young kids self-harming than there's ever been. That suicide watches have had to go up um, amongst the staff watching the children because the kids are suffering so much. This saddens me. This is not how it should be. But it's because our minds are so buzzing everywhere. There is so much going on up here, so many expectations, so many having to please everybody else that our young people are suffering. And it's of all ages, all generations are suffering with mental health issues. And this is sad. It's a sad place for us to be in. So how do we then rise up and say, do you know what, I'm going to devote my mind to God. I'm going to devote everything that's happening up here towards my God. Because that is where our hope comes from. That is where the real answer lies. In Philippians 4, verse 8, I've read it already, but it says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. It's a choice. We can choose to look at everything that's going wrong. We can choose to remember those cruel words that were said to us. We can choose to remember how hard our life is. Or, or we go to this part of the Bible where it says, choose, choose what is true to think about. Choose what is noble, whatever is right and pure, lovely and admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. We train our minds, we train ourselves that when life comes and hits us full pelt in the face, that rather than we have a pity party and drop into our feet, that we look for the good. And if we can't find the good, then we remember that we've got a God who is pure and good, a God that is faithful, a God that will see us through all things. In Psalm 1, verse 3, sorry, in Psalm 1, verse 1 to 3, it says, this is from the Amplified Bible, Blessed, fortunate, prosperous and favoured by God is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, following their advice and example, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit down to rest in the seat of the scoffers, but he but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on these laws, he meditates day and night. He will be like the tree firmly planted and fed by the stream of water, which yields its fruit in all seasons. Its leaves does not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers and comes to 
sorry, comes to mat maturity. Think about all that is good, all that is praiseworthy. Think about and meditate on the word of God. Because when we join those two Bible verses together, as we think about what is good, what is pure, what is full of hope, if we think about the things of God, we meditate on that. The Bible tells us in Psalm 1 that that is when we become like the tree planted by the river, the tree that stays strong, the tree that has fruit all year round, the tree that doesn't wither, the tree that doesn't get weak, but the tree that stands strong, the tree that stands permanently there, constantly there, because it's being fed by the right stuff. It's being fed by the word of God. The Bible is full of hope, full of love, full of encouragement. We can read in the Bible how people that are ill have been made heal. We can read how people that felt that they couldn't do anything now have overcome and done amazing things. If in your life you struggle to find hope, you struggle to find anything good in your life, then let me encourage you, start in the Bible. Start in the Bible and start seeing what God's done through other people because it's the same God we serve. It's the same God that rose Gideon when he felt like he couldn't do anything, rose him up to be a mighty warrior. It's the same God that Peter, when he was too scared to even say he knew Jesus and he ran from the crowds, later on is preaching in the town street, town, in the town centre. <laughs> You see, when we encounter God, when we meditate on God, when we spend time with God, it raises us up. It makes us strong. It makes us powerful, victorious. Now, there's a clip in um, The Lion King, a good old Disney film, where in this film, we've got Simba, and Simba is made to believe that he's um, been part of his dad's death. So he's now legged it, and he's sort of gone away from his friends and family and all that he knows. He's sort of turned down his right to be king because he feels he's responsible for his dad's death. And he grows up away from everything. And then later on in the film, his past comes and smacks him right in the face. Because as he's out minding his own business, one of his old friends happens to be there at the same time. They both meet, and he's like... I don't know what to do with all this information. I don't know what to do with what's happening. And he sort of goes on a bit of a identity crisis, does our poor Simba in the film. But in this film, you have this very uh, moving scene where his dad, who has died, then sort of appears in the clouds and says, Simba, you have forgotten me. And Simba's like, no, I haven't. I would never forgive you. And he's like, Simba, you have forgotten who you are. Therefore... You have forgotten me. That's my um, voice of the dad. <laughs> Do you like it? But, well, it is. Is Simba forgot his roots. He forgot where he came from. So his dad comes to him and says, you have forgotten who you are. And there's too many of us sitting here today and we've forgotten who we are. There's too many of us sitting here today and actually the loudest voice in our head is the situation that's waiting for us back home. The loudest voice in our head is what other people think about us, what other people are saying about us. We're thinking about all the situations that haven't worked out for us, and they are just going round and round and round in our heads, and we've forgotten who we are. Because we sit here today victorious because we are children of God. We sit here as amazing human beings, but we have forgotten who we are. Now, somebody in the Bible who forgot who they were is David, when we read the story of David and Bathsheba. Now, David is a great character in the Bible. He's the one as a little boy that overcame a giant. And then as his sort of life goes on, he does become king. And when he becomes king, he then sort of gets a bit sort of idle in what he's thinking about and how he's spending his time. And then at a moment when he's supposed to go to war with his people, the ark of God is going, his men are going, David decides to stay at home. So straight away, he's not positioning himself where he should be. And while he stays at home, he sort of goes for a little walk one evening and he looks out and he sees a lady having a bath on the rooftop, which is like normal back then. But she's having this bath and he decides to have a look. This is a king. And he's like, she's nice. Oh, I like her. His mind now is not where it should be. His mind now is not on the things above. It's not on the things of God. He's not thinking about what is true and noble. He's not thinking about the things that are praiseworthy. But instead, he's seeing Bathsheba. He's seeing something that he likes a lot, and he's like, I want. 
I want. So he asks who she is, and he finds out that she's a married woman. Yet still, he invites her to the palace. She comes to the palace. They end up sleeping together, and she gets pregnant. And now fear strikes because David is king. He shouldn't be getting、um, married women pregnant. This this will not do. So he's like, oh, I've got to cover my tracks. Now the sorry, Bathsheba's husband. He's at war. He's where he should be. He's with his men. He's with the ark of God, and they're fighting for victory for God. So David decides he's going to call the husband back and just find out what's happening on the battlefield. And so he calls him back and he gets him to do a little report about what's happening. And then he says, "Oh, you might as well stay here. Go home. Go home for the evening." Because you see, David's plan is get the husband back. The husband and wife have a bit of ulalaring. He can then say that the、um, baby that's in the mummy's、um, uh, mummy's stomach now is actually the husband's. But this man is so noble. This man is so wanting to do the right thing. Is so true to nature that actually he doesn't go back home. He sleeps with the servants because he feels he cannot go home and enjoy a little bit of comfort with his wife because his men are still out fighting. The ark of God is still under a tent. Who is he then to go home and have all this comfort? So he's like, no, no, I'm not worthy of that. I will not. I will stay with the servants. I will sleep here, and then I'll go back to the battlefield the next day. So David's like, okay, do that, but then stay two more nights and come and see me on the second night as well. On the second night, David tries to get the husband drunk, hoping then that you know he will sort of let his guard down, go home, sleep with his wife, and they can pretend that none of this has happened. But the man still does not go back to his wife. Therefore, the truth that he slept with his wife will come out. That David was slept with his wife will come out. So he does something absolutely horrendous. He sends him back to the battlefield with a letter, with a letter to his commander that's pretty much saying, "Kill him," because what he says is, he says, "Look, when he gets back to you, put him on the front line, put him where the battle is at its strongest, and then pull everybody else back." So this husband that's done nothing wrong, this husband that has done everything right to this point, he then goes back to the battlefield, unknown what's going to happen to him, and ends up. Being killed in the battle because David was trying to hide a sin. David was trying to hide the fact that his mind wasn't in the right place. That he messed up. He didn't want to get caught. So an innocent man died because David's head was messed up. That is not what God wants. That is not when God called David what he wanted to happen. Then, as David is、um, sort of、um, still in the palace and everything, he gets visited by Nathan the prophet, and Nathan the prophet tells him a little story—a little story about two men, one rich, one poor. The rich man had lots and lots of sheep; the poor man only had one. But this little sheep, this little lamb. He loved a lot the poor man. In fact, he loved it so much that he would let it feed in their home. It became like a daughter to him. It grew up with his family. They loved this little lamb. Then one day, the rich man gets a guest to come. Now he's got loads of lambs. He's got loads of sheep. Does he kill one of his own? No, he wants to keep his wealth. He wants to keep what he's got. So he goes to the poor man. He takes the lamb. He kills the lamb and he feeds it to his guest. As David is hearing this story, he gets really angry, and he's like, "What? That's awful to do. Who does he think he is to go after that lamb? Who does he think he is? He cannot get away with this. He has to pay for this four times over. Tell me who he is, because he has to die." And the neighbor looks at him and says, "King David, it's you. It's you, because you see, David went after what wasn't his." David let his mind wander. David, rather than looking up and thinking about all that is true and noble, all that is praiseworthy, rather than thinking about things of God, he let his human desires take over. He let what he saw become the main voice in his head, and he looked and he was like, "I want." And he went with those desires rather than what he knew was right. And because of that, bad, bad things happened. That poor little baby didn't survive, but. David and Bathsheba did get married. They repented. They turned around, and then they actually went on to have another son, which was Solomon, who actually became king later on. Because you see, we do all mess up. We all do get it wrong. But God's grace will restore us and bring the situation back round.
So know that there is always, always hope. There is always hope that a situation can be made into good. But you see, David is an example there of somebody that knew better. He knew what was right. He knew where his mind should be, but he let his mind wander. And because of that, an innocent man died. A baby died, all because his mind was in the wrong place. We need to make sure that our minds are focused on all that is true, all that is noble, all that is praiseworthy. We need to make sure that our mind is on heavenly things, that at all times we are fixed on God. David was very quick to say that the rich man should pay for his sins. Because you see, it's easy to look at other people, to look at other people and say, ah, they got that wrong. To look at other people and say, well, they shouldn't be doing that. But actually today, the mirror is in front of you. How are you? How's your mind? How are you doing? Are you looking upwards or are the situations in your life overtaking and that's where your focus is? Your focus needs to be upwards, not on your situations, not on your emotions, not on what is happening at home or at school, at college, in your family, but actually at all times, we're looking up. Fix your eyes on God. Now, um, Simba was told by his dad, you've forgotten who you are. So for those of you here that may have forgotten who you are, let me remind you. Let me remind you who you are. You belong to this family. You belong. In 1 John 3 verse 1, it says, The Father has loved us so much that we are called children of God, and we really are his children. We are victorious. Romans 8 verse 37 says, In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. There's a saying that me and Charles have, um, that we sort of had in our order of services when we got married as well, about the best is yet to come. And we get that from God, because in Ephesians 3, verse 20, it says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to his powers, that it works in us. You are wonderfully and fearfully made, as it says in Psalm 139, and you are unstoppable. Philippians 4, verse 13 says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Who are you? You are victorious. Who are you? You're a child of God. Who are you? You're somebody that can do all things, that there are no, no blockages in front of you because you are a child of God, an overcomer. Who are you? You're fearfully and wonderfully made. Remember who you are. Fix your mind on him. When life comes at you full pelt, when situations get loud, when they get hard, you tell that situation who you are. Do not forget who you are. Don't belittle yourself, but instead speak the truth to who you are. Now, there's another film I want to reference, and this time it's The Last Night, which is the most recent Transformers films. And um, I quite like the Transformer films. And there's a character in it, Optimus Prime. And Optimus Prime, he is like the main chief. He is like um, the boss, if you like. But he is a good guy, well, robot, actually. But he, he's good, OK? He is like everything in him is good and pure. And he sort of come and he's taken upon himself to save planet Earth. And there's several other films that have gone before, and he's always the one that's been righteous, the one that's come in and saved the day. Now, in the last film, Optimus Prime is having a little bit of a dilemma, because you see he's gone back to the past. He's gone back to his own planet, which is being destroyed, is going to be wiped out, and now he's really torn. His purpose is to save planet Earth, but now if he saves planet Earth, his own planet is going to be wiped out. And this does Optimus Prime's head in. He's like, ah, oh, and he's like, Earth must be destroyed. And you're kind of watching this film and you're like, no, Optimus Prime, come on, this is not you. But then as you get to the end of the film, as there's a big battle, all these robots are sort of trying to save planet Earth. In comes Optimus Prime. And as the enemy rises up and the sword to sort of destroy him, Optimus Prime says, have you forgotten who I am? Have you forgotten who I am? As the enemy is coming to him, as the enemy is right there, he's like, hello, have you forgotten who I am? And you know what? As children of God, 
This should be our attitude. This should be who we are. That as the world comes and smacks us hard, as situations happen and we don't understand why that situation's happened, rather than crumbling to our feet and going, oh, it's not fair, or I don't know what to do, we go to the problem, we go to the issue and say, have you forgotten who I am? I am a child of God. I am victorious. If God is for me, who can be against me? We speak truth. We speak scripture over the issues that we're facing because then we stay standing. Then instead of looking at the problem and running in the other direction, we stand up and we say, have you forgotten who I am? We come with confidence. We come with boldness because we are children of God. There is nothing, let me stress this big time to you, there is nothing in this world that can overcome God. Nothing that God cannot handle. So as his children, as we stand with him, we are overcomers. We can achieve, even when we can't see it in our human eyes. We know our God, we know who we are, so we stand strong and we say, I can do this. Have you forgotten who I am? I am victorious. I am with God. He's with me. I can do all things because of him. Where is your mind at? Have you forgotten who you are? Or are you telling this world, have you forgotten who I am? Where is your head at? Now, I just want to finish... Um, today with a little illustration because it's vital we get this. We need to understand how important it is to be controlling our minds because there is a thousand and one things that will try to come in and take over your mind. It could be words of somebody else. It could be an experience that we've had. It could be this, that life seems so hard and these thoughts will come in. So here I have two minds. Two minds but they're going to have two different mindsets. Now, this mindset, this is mindset number one. And mindset number one wants to do what we've read in Philippines. It wants to think about all that is good, all that is pure. It wants to think about things of God. It tries its hardest to go, yeah, my God is good. But you see, life happens. And as life happens, people come and they say the cruelest of things. <coughs> and the mind starts getting marked. They then go to work, and you know what, work is not great at the moment, and it's just hard work, and they again, they start thinking about everything that's not going right, all the things that they're not doing, or can't do, or don't have the money to do, and they're not thinking about all that is good and all that is pure, they're thinking instead about the situation they're in. They're thinking instead about everything that's going wrong or they're thinking about how weak they feel. And they let these thoughts penetrate into them. They let these thoughts start dictating how they act, how they feel. And the mind that once looked so good, the mind that once was thinking about all that is good and pure, now has become a right mess. Now is starting to look not as it once was. And you see, when our mind becomes a mess like this, we need to be people that are able to think about the things of God, that are able to put God first. But when we let all these thoughts penetrate into us, when we let these thoughts come in and dictate to us who we are, dictate to us how we're feeling, then the mind just becomes one huge mess that we can no longer control. And when we get into this state, all you can do is come into the throne room of God. Come to him and we need to learn to lay things down. And when we lay things down, we leave them there. We don't pick them back up. Because you see, our minds are not designed to look like this. Our minds are not supposed to be penetrated by everything that's happening in this world. Hard times come and they go bang into us and it hurts. That people say things to us and it goes bang and that becomes our identity. People have no right to give you your identity. Your identity comes from your creator. If anybody's sitting here today and you're living under the lie of what other people have spoken over you, that needs to be broken because you are a beautiful, mighty child of God. And this is how you need to live. My number one now needs therapy. It now needs a lot of work. But you see, when God created us, when he gave us this beautiful mind in our heads, this is not what he wanted to happen to it. But then we have mind number two. 
Now, my number two, again, wants to do what is in Philippians. My number two wants to think about all that is good and pure, all that is glorious and worthy, and it wants to be thinking about the things of God. But my number two is still in a human being, and life happens. So they're there, and they're at work, and something's said, and their mind starts getting marked, and and they're like, oh, that wasn't so good, and work happens, and it just all sucks at work at the moment, and their mind starts getting marked. But you see, what my number two has done is rather than just waiting for something bad to happen and going to God, they go to God daily because they understand how important it is that their mind is renewed by God daily. So when these thoughts come, when it all gets a bit tough, it doesn't penetrate in, it just stays on the surface because you see, their foundations are so much stronger. Their foundations will not let them crumble because their foundations are in God. And when life gets to them, when somebody says something that hurts, they go to to God, they give it to God. When work doesn't go as we plan, they take it to God. And when we take it to God, God renews it. And our mind, yet again, comes. Let me just take the gloves off, sorry. Our mind becomes as it was once intended. I'm covered in dye, sorry. Our mind comes back to how it was intended with no marks, because you see, even though people say to us, it's not going to go in, it's not going to go in, it's just going to brush off us, because God is at the centre. When life happens, we're strong, we're strong, we're solid. Our mind cannot be damaged, our mind cannot be sort of just ripped apart, because we know who we are, we know who we are and we stand strong. We devote our minds to God, saying, God, I know you've got this, God, I know you're there for me. Our minds are strong. Our minds dictate to us who we are, what we're going to do, how we react to things. We must, must be people that protect our minds. We can read about the armour of God that tells us to put on the helmet of salvation because God knows we need to be protecting what goes up here. We need to be protecting what images we let into our heads. We need to be protecting what words we let in here, what um, experiences we let speak into us. Now, some of you ladies came to chat with us not that long ago for a ladies' conference there where a girl called Laura Edmonds spoke. And she spoke about the mind being like a computer. And she said that um, with a computer, if you let information sit there for too long, the computer then thinks, oh, I want that, so I'm going to download it. And once something's downloaded, it's a lot harder to get rid of. So she said, imagine your mind is like a computer, that as you're there, thoughts come in, and then you need to decide, because again, it's a choice, you decide, is that thought good for me? Do I want that thought? And then straight away, if it's not good for you, don't have a little pity party first, but say, no, get out my head. You drop it, you give it straight to God, so it doesn't download, and it cannot penetrate you, and it doesn't damage your mind. And then those things that are good, those things that encourage you, those things that build you up, they're things that go, ah, you can download, you can stay in my head, you can be downloaded so that I stand strong for another day. Where's your mind at? Who are you? Is your mind on the things of God or is your mind on situations around you? Mindset number one, they wanted to do the right thing. They knew God. They wanted to give all the praise and glory to him. But life just got too hard. But because their foundations weren't in the right place, their mind became a big mess. Mindset number two, daily, daily went to God and said, God, I'm giving this to you. God, help me in this. And renewed their mindset daily. We must be people that daily go to God, that daily go to our creator, spend time with him, let him renew our minds so that we stand strong. Devote your mind, devote all that you are to God because you are victorious, you will overcome. Now the worship group are going to come back up and um, do some worship with us. But the challenge is for each one of us here. Only you can keep your mind healthy. We can advise it, we can encourage you up front in church, but the responsibility, your mind is your responsibility. Therefore, I urge every single one of you, spend time with God, 
Renew, let God renew your mind so it stays strong. And then as it says in Philippians, think about all that is true and noble, that is praiseworthy. Think about the things of God, because there is hope and there is life. Thank you.